Good afternoon. I'm Alyssa Armstrong, and I will be your moderator for today's press conference. Before the speakers introduce themselves, I would like to make everyone aware that we are accommodating a number of busy schedules between clinical surgeries and more. Therefore, we are placing a hard stop on the press conference at 3 p.m., and we will do our best to address as many questions as possible in the allotted time frame. We have a Spanish interpreter on another channel through ATXN, so this is a reminder for all of our guests to speak simply and clearly for our interpreters. Dr. Escott, Interim Austin Travis County Health Authority will start us off with a situational report and will be followed by a number of dedicated medical professionals from the Austin Travis County area and around Central Texas. After that, we will open it up to our pool reporter with KUT who will ask the questions of our speakers. Now I'll pass it off to Dr. Escott. Thank you very much. Uh, and as I get my slides up on the screen, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank my colleagues from around the city and county who've joined us today. Uh, the public's heard a lot from me regarding COVID-19 and uh, I'm gonna talk a little more, but I, then I'm gonna pass it over to them uh, because they have important voices too. And it's, it's important that, that folks really understand what's happening, how uh, the situation has changed, and what it looks like going forward in the future. Uh, because these folks that you're gonna hear from today are the ones who are gonna be taking care of people on the front lines. They're the ones who are gonna be putting themselves at risk, their families at risk, and their colleagues at risk. Uh, and, uh, and you need to hear their voices. Uh, but before we hear from them, I just wanna give you a quick update on, on where we are right now. Uh, the slide I'm showing you now is our uh, confirmed cases in Travis County. Uh, as you're aware, we've had a substantial increase in our cases over the past several weeks. Uh, right now, our moving average, which is the line that's shown in yellow, is at 276 new cases per day. And obviously, we've had many more than that uh, on some days over the past uh, week in particular. Uh, that's, that's a concerning trend for us, and it's concerning because of this, this hockey stick appearance that we're seeing in new cases as well as, uh, as well as our other metrics that we're paying attention to. Uh, the other thing that has an impact on is our doubling time. So as you can see from this, again, the, the blue is the, the daily doubling time, the yellow is the seven day moving average of that doubling time. You can see that we hit a, a peak, a good peak, uh, back in, in the first week of June, around June the 7th of 44 days which means it takes 44 days on estimation for that number, whatever that case number is, to double. Today, that doubling time has dropped to about 18 days. Uh, so it's dropped more than half. And what that means is that we have about 6,600 cases as of today. That based on these numbers, if this trend continues, that in 18 days, or perhaps less, if that doubling time continues to drop, we'll have more than 13,000 cases. Uh, the other thing that it's important to understand is that when we talk about cases, it's the, the total number of cumulative cases, it's not just about that, it's about the active cases. So we take into consideration now we have less than 2,000 active cases. If we look two weeks from now, and if we double in two weeks, then we're gonna have more than 6,000 active cases. And as that, that doubling time continues to drop, it seems likely that as early as three weeks, it would double again from now, three, three weeks from now. So in three weeks, having 13 or 14 or 15,000 active cases. And this is, this is why we've, we've got to increase our seriousness about what we're doing, about the conversations that we're having. Uh, because unlike hurricanes, we have the ability to change this storm, to downgrade this storm. Uh, but, but folks need to understand what we're talking about and the magnitude of impact that this storm could have. Uh, that impact is already being seen on our hospital admissions. Uh, so again, the yellow line here is showing the seven day moving average of new admissions, which is our primary indicator for our, our change in stages. You can see that you know we were at about eight to 10 uh, on that seven day moving average for quite some time and we're doing very well. But then all of a sudden we have this substantial increase where now we're at about uh, 40. And today it seems likely that we will surpass 40 hospitalizations, new hospitalizations on that seven day moving average. Uh, yesterday we had a record of 56 new admissions. 
Today, it seems likely that we'll have more than 50 admissions today. And I bring this up because it's likely that we'll continue to uh, increase very quickly, moving from 40 to 50 to 70 in a very short period of time, perhaps over the next two weeks, unless we have substantial change in the transmission of disease. The impact is also evident on our hospital systems. So this is showing us the uh, blue line is showing current hospitalizations. The orange is showing those individuals who are in the ICU in critical care. And the uh, gray is showing the, uh, the ventilator use. So you can see that hockey stick appearance of, of the hospitalizations as well. Uh, you can see a similar trend when it comes to ICU admissions. So what this means is that we've gone from about 100 uh, uh, hospital beds being used at around June the 7th to today, uh, which will be uh, in the neighborhood of 275 in a very short period of time. Uh, so again, right now, the hospitals have capacity. Uh, you know, there's, we're not at risk this week or next week of not having beds or ICU beds or ventilators for people. What we're concerned about is what's happening two or three weeks or four weeks from now uh, because of this exponential nature of this disease. So looking at some updated projections from uh, the great work of Dr. Lauren Myers and her group at the University of Texas Modeling Consortium, uh, you can see that we've increased our estimation of surge beds which are available in the Austin MSA to around 1,500 beds. Uh, right now, the, the, the dark uh, black line that you see here is, is data that we've collected already. That's where we are, that transition between the thick black line and the, the uh, thinner black line. Uh, you can see that the, the best guess of the projections, if things don't change, if people don't take more protective behaviors, if we uh, are not successful in decreasing that doubling time, that by mid-July, we're going to exceed hospital capacity. This is why we're asking everyone to take action now, to act as if a shelter in place order were existing today. As the governor said earlier this week, if you don't need to go out, don't go out. If you don't need to, to congregate or, or get together with people, don't do it. Uh, we really have to transition our mindset back to what it was in April so that we can get control of this so we don't endanger the, uh, the, the healthcare system and our, our first responders and healthcare workers and so that we can keep businesses open, keep the economy going, but we need action. And with that, I'll pass it to Dr. John Abikhalid, who is the president of the Travis County Medical Society. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm a surgeon here in Austin. Uh, so I'm in the hospitals, I'm seeing patients every day. Um, I want to uh, explain a little bit more of what Dr. Escott was talking about with regard to the hockey stick or the exponential spread of a virus. And I think it's really important to understand what that means. Now we all know about how things go viral on the internet. You see something funny, a cat video, and you share it with 10 people. And those 10 people share it with 10 people each. So now you're up to 100 people. And those 100 share it to another 10. So you're up to 1,000. They keep sharing, and 1,000 becomes 10,000, and then 100,000, and then a million. So in only six cycles of transmission, one person affects 1 million people. Real viruses, like the new coronavirus, work in exactly the same way. When one person has been infected, he or she will spread it to several others. And those people will, will in turn infect many more. And so it goes. We face another problem with the coronavirus. It's really sneaky. It spreads very easily. You can have it for days or even a couple of weeks and not know it. And all the while, you unintentionally spread it to your family members, your friends, and your coworkers. It's also unpredictable because it affects people in widely different ways. Some people may have barely any symptoms, while others get terribly sick and will be gasping for air and have to be placed on ventilators with plastic tubes in their windpipes in the ICU, sometime for days or even weeks. Those folks can have multiple problems 
that stem from the sever severity of their illness. And many people die. Over 120,000 have died so far in America. And worldwide, we're approaching 500,000 deaths. In one way, though, the virus is not sneaky. It cares not whether its victims are Asian, Black, Hispanic, or white. It is equally eager to invade the lungs of a Christian, a Hindu, a Jew, or a Muslim. It won't consider your, gen your gender, and it will infect you whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. During the lockdown, we did something amazing. We proved that we can control the virus and flatten the curve. We did that by simply changing our behavior. For a couple of months, there was amazing cooperation among all of us to accomplish that goal. But then we got tired, we got a little stir crazy, and we lowered our guard. As a result, the virus has surged and it's taking lives as it multiplies. There is a middle ground, somewhere between complete lockdown and uncontrolled viral spread. It simply involves doing the things that we know we should do, distancing ourselves, wearing masks, washing our hands, minimizing social excursions, and absolutely staying home when you feel sick. What happens over the next several days and weeks is completely up to us. How we behave and how we cooperate with each other will make a difference. The thousands of physicians and nurses and other healthcare workers in the Austin area will be there to care for you if you get sick. But to do that, we need the staff, we need the resources, we need the hospital beds, and we need the medicines to do our jobs. If the exponential growth continues unimpeded as it is, some of those things may run out. Good ideas can spread like a virus as well. It's time now for this idea to go viral. Controlling COVID depends on us, on our actions, and on how we cooperate with each other. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Dr. Kirsten Miet. Thank you so much, John. Um, as a medicine pediatric hospitalist, I am a doctor who specializes in the care of sick adults and children in the hospital. I've been fortunate to be a part of a team that uh, has discharged over 200 patients with coronavirus. And today, my hope is to share with you my gratitude, but also my concerns and hope. First of all, I'm grateful that Central Texas had a three-month lag in the surge of coronavirus relative to Seattle and New York. And thanks to the thoughtful and early response by leaders to close schools, cancel large events, and to our community for physically distancing, this saved lives. Uh, as did our Central Texas Public Health, medical providers, and hospital systems who worked together to ensure that our hospitals were prepared, that we had adequate protective equipment, and that healthcare workers and patients were safe. I'm concerned. We've seen a tremendous increase in numbers of coronavirus cases, as well as hospitalizations and specifically critically ill patients. And that's because the physical distancing measures have been abandoned by many, by many people in our community. I'm also concerned by the changing demographics of the infection. Many of the early cases that we saw were in vulnerable populations because people could not choose to isolate. The new cases that we're seeing in our community are because people are actively choosing to congregate and to not isolate or mask. I'm also concerned uh, that this choice is based on a false hope that we have comparatively low death rates in Austin and in Texas compared to other cities. But I think it's really important to highlight that death is not the only marker of this disease. Morbidity, or how bad the disease is, more specifically, how unlikely someone is to return to their normal state after the disease um, has resolved is a more important marker in my opinion. Coronavirus is a bad disease. The inflammatory storm that we see caused by this virus is unlike anything we've ever seen. The virus attacks lungs and puts people on ventilators for weeks, not days, which is typical of other respiratory infections. It injures the brain, heart, liver, and kidneys and increases our risk of blood clots, strokes, and heart attacks. And we have seen this even in teenagers and healthy 20 and 30 year olds. It's important to know that coronavirus has consequences beyond death um, and that one may live 
but require weeks or months of rehabilitation, or live but not walk, talk, or work again. So I'm hopeful that our leaders and the public have the wisdom to interpret what we're seeing as a true surge, the surge that it is, and that we can return to the same level of physical distancing and masking that we did in March and April because it worked. Finally, I do want to emphasize to those who are fortunate to recover from coronavirus, I hope that you will donate plasma at We Are Blood and other donation centers so that we can continue to share your immune fighting ability with those who are sick with coronavirus and are still fighting for their lives in our hospitals. And I want everyone to be well. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Chris Zybel. Thank you, Dr. Tanto, for, uh, for your words and for your introduction. Um, I'm an emergency physician here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I take care of uh, folks at a uh, level one trauma center and teaching hospital. Um, I wanted to uh, talk to you all again today to reinforce the message of please mask when you have to leave home. Please stay home when you don't have to go somewhere else. The social isolation, social distancing was working and it can work again uh, before we get to a true crisis mode. Uh, now is the time to intervene, not, not in another two weeks. It'll be, it'll be very late for us in terms of our ability to really provide you the best possible care. Um, I've had a number of conversations with uh, people that I'm close with who see masking as an attack on one's personal liberties. Um, I can understand that perspective. I also can understand that while you are free to do the wrong thing, you are also free to do the right thing. And the right thing to do is to protect yourself from this disease, protect other people from this disease, and uh, do our best to bend the curve so that we can continue to keep our economy open, so that we can continue to provide you with good health care, so that we can continue to keep people working. Um, because uh, if we insist on going down a pathway uh, where the disease runs rampant, uh, the consequences will be more than you can imagine. And uh, we definitely don't want to see that happen to, to you or to anyone. So the, the masking does work, isolation does work, staying home does work, uh, staying more than six to 10 feet away from other people does work. And all of those are things that we can do and should do. And uh, I'm here for you. The other message I wanted to convey today is that emergencies still happen. Uh, the other consequence of COVID that we've seen that I want to avoid is we have seen some people who are so scared of COVID and so good at socially isolating that they have heart attacks at home, they have strokes at home, they have GI bleeding at home. The emergency department is still here for you. If you have an emergency, I want you to come here for an emergency. If you have a rash that you've had for a month and want, to look, want someone to look at it, please go somewhere else or wait until this crisis is over. But if you're having an emergency, if you're having a new acute pain, if you're having neurological symptoms, if you're having chest pain or shortness of breath, that is the time to come to the emergency department. We can keep you safe, we will keep you safe, and, uh, and we will take care of you. And other than that, stay home when you can, venture out minimally, wear your mask, and stay safe. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Pignoni. Thank you, Dr. Zybel. Uh, my name is Mike Pignoni. I'm the chair of internal medicine at Dell Medical School and part of a large team at Dell Med and across the region that's been working to coordinate our response to COVID-19 along with Austin Public Health. Our major priorities are to reduce the burden of suffering from COVID while also keeping our healthcare workforce safe and minimizing the impact of this condition on our economy. I really want to reinforce that we've entered a period of increased spread within our community and that we're seeing this impact on our hospitals and emergency departments, as Dr. Nieto and Dr. Zybel mentioned. We're well prepared to meet these challenges, and I want everyone to know that the hospital remains a very safe place to receive care. You shouldn't delay care or forego care for conditions other than COVID. That said, it's important that we do everything possible to reduce the rate of growth in COVID infections so that our healthcare providers can help those who are infected as best possible. We're gaining expertise every day in how best to support patients with COVID so that as few people as possible suffer complications. For members of the public, the most important things are to wear your masks, limit your contacts outside your household, and help us reduce the rate of infections. 
Up next is Francis Simpson. Hello, I'm Francis Simpson. I'm the Director of Nursing at Seton Medical Center Austin Critical Care. The team of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, pharmacists, patient care techs, housekeepers, supply chain, and many others have been working through COVID to care for patients since March. It's been inspiring to see the team come together and be innovative and adapt to all the changes we've needed to make. The team of providers throughout Central Texas healthcare systems have been collaborating to meet the needs. I've been witness to the courage and sacrifice of the healthcare team as they step forward to care for our COVID patients with professionalism and great compassion. We've had the ability to set up Zoom calls with patients and their families so they could connect remotely. And we've had families use Zoom calls to say prayers and sentiments at the end of life. We're here present in the suffering in this sacred work. We've also had the opportunity to provide hope and encouragement and to celebrate patients discharging home after lengthy hospital stays. There's been a tremendous outpouring from the community in support in many forms. We've had thoughtful and inspiring letters. I have a little COVID busters poster from uh, some kiddos that, that they sent to us. And we ask for your continued support by social distancing and uh, providing a six feet of distance, wearing your mask when you're out in public, good hand washing. We learned from New York and Seattle. We have the benefit of their experience that they didn't have. So we ask you, although it's hard to social distance and it's hard to stay home, that we need your help to help prevent the spread of the virus. I'm going to introduce Dr. Ann Buchanan, St. David's Emergency Physician. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Buchanan. I'm an emergency physician in Austin, Texas. I work for the St. David's Healthcare System and also serve as the regional medical director for both emergency medicine and hospital medicine for part of the St. David's Healthcare System. Uh, I will echo many of the things that have already been mentioned. We have also seen, obviously, a rise and uptick in patients that have had COVID, both ones that are requiring hospitalization and ones that are going home. And as Dr. Escott pointed out, that curve began to rise in early June. And we do believe that that is largely in part to people relaxing and going out and beginning to celebrate the beginning of summer and Memorial Day weekend. And with that, we began to see a spike in cases. Uh, right now, the situation is fluid and is ever changing every day. You as a community have that power to help change this curve and help decrease the number of cases that continue in our community. As many of our, my colleagues have already mentioned, your job and all of our jobs as part of this community is to help each other by masking, socially distancing, and hand washing. You should not leave your home if you are sick. You should not be going to gatherings and parties of large amounts of people if they are unnecessary, because this is going to potentially lead to further spread. As Dr. Zibel mentioned, it is very important for us as emergency physicians to be able to focus on not only COVID, but the other emergencies that continue to happen in the community. And echoing his point that people are staying home because they are scared to come to the emergency room, and we do not want that to happen. It is very important that people still get treated for their heart, heart attacks, for their strokes, for their accidents that happen at home. We do want to recognize that this is continued to be a safe place for those people to come, but for our community as a whole, if we don't stop the spread of COVID, what we're going to do is fill up hospitals and not make room for the other emergencies that do happen and the other people that need to be admitted to the hospital. Again, right now, as mentioned, our hospitals have capacity and our hospitals have surge plans that are in place and we have ever moving targets 
to, able, to be able to take care of this community. But your job is to make sure that we help curb the spread of this virus. So if you have an emergency, if you feel like you're having a stroke, if you're feeling like you're having a heart attack, come to the hospital. We will take care of you and we will keep you safe. If you are sick with cold-like symptoms, flu-like symptoms, and are not having shortness of breath, and you do not feel like you need to seek emergent medical care, stay in your home and keep others safe. Wash your hands and keep your families safe. And also help keep our healthcare workers safe because we do have healthcare workers that have gotten ill from this as well. We don't want our healthcare workers to not be around to be able to take care of all of you. We have had colleagues that have gone to work in New York and New Jersey during the height when we were, our cases were low, but the East Coast cases were high. And they have lots of stories and lots of experience to bring back. But we have already shown that we can help curb this virus from what we did the earlier months of this all starting out. So we encourage you to go back to the social distancing that existed and help keep our community safe, help keep your children safe, help keep your grandmothers safe, and make sure that we all can continue to thrive as this great community as we are. And with that, I will turn that over to Dr. Tobelman, who will speak. Well, hello, my name is Ross Tobelman, and I'm the uh, medical director of emergency physician for Baylor Scott and White. Um, and one of the benefits of going later on in this uh, presentation is that I can echo uh, what some of my colleagues have said. Um, as a second generation Austinite, I have seen many changes in our city um, and none more striking than the changes that we've been going through over the last several months as we've been facing um, the coronavirus. I want to reiterate that, you know, as an emergency physician, we are trained to see and take care of anybody who walks in through our emergency doors. And we can and still are able to take care of anybody that comes in to see us, whether that is somebody with chest pain, somebody with a headache, or somebody with COVID-19, we are able to take care of those patients. And one of the reasons that we're able to take care of those patients now is because of all the hard work that we put into flattening the curve early in this disease process by wearing our masks, by social distancing at that point. And we are at a crevice, uh, at a press, at a, at a, um, a juncture in this disease where we have a choice. We can either make the hard decision to continue to socially distance, to wear our masks and be socially responsible, or we can choose not to make those hard choices and see where the disease takes us. I know that we don't wanna see all of our hard work that we've done over the last several months, just throw that away and then, and then continue to have serious problems that we've seen in New York and other places. So I encourage you all to wear your mask. It's like a seatbelt. You know, you, you don't always think that you need your seatbelt until you get in that car wreck, and then you really wish that you had that seatbelt on. Um, and the mask is very similar. You may not think that you need it, but it is vitally important to keep not only you safe, but your family members safe. Um, I know that these times are challenged. Um, having young kids in the high school and the middle schools here in Austin, it, it has been difficult not being able to go to school, not for them to see their friends. But if we continue to socially distance, if we continue to push that curve flatter, then we will be able to do those things that we loved much sooner than we would otherwise. And now I um, hand this over to Dr. Zamora. Gracias, Dr. Mustas. Voy a hablar con mis paisanos, latinos, que hablan español. Lo que han dicho todos los doctores ahorita, las enfermeras, son que tenemos que seguir haciendo lo que se hace para proteger a los, a los pacientes, que es, que es protegernos, usar nuestras bocas, usar los guantes, lavar las manos, no, to, no a tocar los ojos, la nariz o la boca, si está enfermo. Si está enfermo, quedarse en casa. Muy importante si está enfermo. Mantener la, la, las reuniones bajas a 10, no, no más de 10 personas en una reunión. 
Y si está enfermo, no vayas a hacer reunión. Uh, lo más importante de todo este mensaje es que las, las, los casos de virus están subiendo. Los números de los pacientes en hospital están subiendo. Los números de los pacientes que están en los respiradores están subiendo. Todo es muy peligroso porque vamos, se nos va a acabar los, los, los resources, los, las, las maneras de mantener a los pacientes sanos. Entonces, por favor, hagan su, su parte en, en mantenernos todos safe en el, en el condado de Travis, en la ciudad de, de Austin. El doctor Abby Caldo lo dijo, lo dijo mejor. Si una persona tiene corona y se lo pasa a 10, y esas personas, esas 10 personas se lo pasan a 10 más, el número se sube fácilmente a un millón de personas. Fácil. No queremos que nos, los, esos casos sufres, pasen aquí en Austin. Usen su tapaboca, usen sus, 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 sus uh, guantes y protéjense todos. Gracias. Thank you, Dr. Zamora. Uh, I see that Dr. Mullen has joined us. Dr. Mullen, do you have anything to add before we begin the Q&A portion? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to uh, start by saying I'm so happy to reinforce the message of every one of my colleagues on this call. I'm Dr. Jewel Mullen from Dell Medical School. I'm a primary care doctor, and I've spent a lot of time working in public health. When I was little, My family used to call me the Surgeon General because I was big on trying to keep people from getting sick. I didn't like to see my parents smoke. I thought people should wear their seat belts. And so what I want to do right now is say, in practicing with my patients, I didn't only want to take care of them when they were sick. I wanted to do everything that I could to keep them from getting sick. So this conversation about coronavirus is just my next next big attempt to say every one of us has tools, the tools that each one of my colleagues has talked about to protect ourselves and to protect one another. The privilege of being a, do a doctor for me has always been that people trusted me, that they trusted me with their health. As a public health doctor, One of the things that concerns me the most right now is that there's so much swirling in our country, in our state, in our city, in our communities, that sometimes people don't know who to trust. One of the other things that I like about being a medical professional is at least the last time that I checked, doctors and nurses were still considered some of the most trustworthy people in our society. My plea, my suggestion, my message, having heard all of this advice about covering your face, washing your hands, keeping your distance, knowing that you can protect yourself and one another's is good, sound medical advice, and it's simple. The advice I'd like to add is to you choose. You choose which trusted medical advice you like, which sound evidence-based medical advice that you know isn't just political talk or mumbo jumbo and stick with it. If you don't know where else to turn, you just heard from a whole bunch of people who are offering that kind of advice. Austin Public Health is offering that advice. Maybe your own doctors are offering that advice. And if you follow it, you'll have more information about how to protect yourself. You can get more reassurance about how protecting yourself might be knowing when to get tested, understanding what it really means if somebody wants to ask you who you've been around so that you can help protect them too, and being really clear about how to keep yourself from getting any sicker. Two things that worry me are overconfidence and fear. People who are overconfident that they're not going to get sick or people who are afraid that they will sometimes go into denial and they don't do what they need to do for themselves. Try to avoid both of those things, overconfidence and fear. And if you stick with a trusted messenger, that can help you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Mullen, for those words. Uh, we will now move on to the question and answer portion. So I will invite our pool reporter to begin that segment. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so we tackled ICU capacity. So I'm gonna nix that from my, this is a question from KUT. Um, and I'm gonna ask, what about staffing? Even if there's adequate room at this point for more COVID patients, is there to staff to handle all these patients? Uh, I can start off, and then if, if somebody else wants to jump in, uh, th they're certainly welcome. Uh, you know, obviously, we've had discussions about staffing, uh, not only uh, in preparation for the surge piece, but also uh, with the expectation that, you know, if, if the cases continue to rise particularly quickly, that some of the people on this screen, certainly their colleagues, uh, have the potential to be sick and, and not able to take care of others. Uh, so in talking with the healthcare systems, uh, they have uh, prepared for those, they've planned for those. Uh, we are certainly planning uh, for those uh, possibilities from the city and the county perspective, not only in the healthcare sector, but also in, in, in public safety. Uh, so these are that, uh, that question of, of personnel availability is part of the planning and, uh, and we'll continue to uh, to identify needs and, and, and fill gaps uh, as we see them. I didn't know if anybody else, uh, Chris or, or Ann, if, if y'all have anything to add. I mean, I can echo just what she said. You know, the staffing is capability is there now and there are surge plans in place for both nursing staffing as well as physician staffing. Should we need, you know, we have, we as physicians have ability to cover physicians if they get sick, we have uh, advanced practice care providers that can help. Um, so I think we're in a good place there. We've been planning for this for months in anticipation of a surge. And we're, we had, we anticipate that there will not be any difficulty in that coverage. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I, I want to put in a little piece of caution with that as well, though, because we know that as the conditions become more crowded, we, we know this from other communities, the mortality rate does go up. And so I, I don't want the citizens of Austin and Travis County in the region to get the feeling that, okay, the healthcare system's had three months to prepare, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get COVID. Um, that, that is not the message today. The message today is um, we're making plans for the worst and you are better off if we don't get there. And I'll add that over the past couple of weeks, as, as we've seen the numbers rise, when I'm in the hospitals, I'm always polling my colleagues and asking them, how were things last night? And I'll commonly hear, it was really busy. We had a lot of people come in, but they opened up new units and they called in more staff and we, we managed it. Uh, the, the question is, at, at what point does that become difficult? And um, are we gonna let ourselves get to that point? Uh, where um, where we don't have staffing supplies, beds, and things that we need. Um, and that's why now is the time for us to do something. Uh, because of the delayed development of symptoms, what we do now will take a couple of weeks to have effect. So we, the sooner we start, the better. Yeah, but take the next question. It appears our pool reporter may be having an issue, so I'll go ahead and read the next question from Reporte Austin. We have seen big, bigger than, oh, you're here? Okay, good. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was muted and it wouldn't let me unmute my, I think you, the host has to unmute me. Um, this is from Roborte Austin. They say, we have seen bigger enforcement by TABC in bars. However, they seem to be focused in the downtown area. Can we expect more presence from the authorities all over the city to make sure bars, clubs, and restaurants are following the safety guidelines? Uh, so I'll be happy to take that one. Uh, look, right now we're in the stage where we've got to do whatever we can short of, of closing things down to really get a lid back on this. Well, the lid's off, we've got to put it back on. Uh, so 
you know, I think that involves transitioning from, from reinforcement to enforcement. I think it does involve, uh, you know, bars and, and other places that, that pose a higher risk for disease transmission. Obviously, it's hard to bar with a mask on. It's hard to drink and socialize with a mask on in a bar. Uh, so that is probably one of the most concerning uh, things that we have open right now. Uh, certainly my advice to, to the public is don't go to a bar. Now's not the time. I wish it was the time. I'd love to be in one myself, but now's not the time. We've got to be very, very careful. And, you know, my recommendation uh, to, to the city manager and to the mayor has also been that we need to look at, at increasing enforcement of other things that we can. Uh, because it's clear that, you know, that some folks are taking liberties with with, uh, you know, the regulations that have been put in place. They've, they've been hurting, they're concerned that their businesses is, uh, may not be able to continue. Uh, so they're, they may be taking some liberties with, with the occupancy limit. Uh, we simply can't do that. Uh, the only thing that risks is us going back into a shutdown and none of us want that. So we are pleading with people, with bar owners, restaurant owners, businesses of all kinds. Think of the permissible occupancy as the absolute ceiling for the number of people who can be in your at your site. If you can tolerate something less than that ceiling, please do so. If your ceiling is 50% and you can stay in business at 25%, make the cut now. Uh, because again, and I, I can't stress this enough, if we do not make significant change right now, then we are going to be in a situation within the next week to two weeks where I'm going to have to make the recommendation to the mayor and judge that we shut down. And I do not want to do that. We need your cooperation. We need your action now. Thank you. The next question is from Elson American Statesman. We have seen and received reports of long lines at testing locations throughout the city and county. Are more people seeking testing than we can handle right now? How long do most people wait for a test and or to receive results? How are health officials addressing the increased desire for testing as capacity increases? So we, we have uh, you know, some variability in, in the duration of time it takes for folks to, to schedule a test. And you know, quite frankly, right now, we also have folks who, who have the means to get tested at private places. Uh, that are utilizing community care and Austin Public Health uh, pre-drive-through testing uh, to get their testing done. Uh, and that's, that's creating a, a bit of a backlog uh, on some days. So what we're asking is that if folks have resources, if they're insured, see if you can access testing at other places. Uh, there's a number of services uh, around town. There's Austin Regional Clinic that does a, a huge amount of testing. Uh, and, and we'll have those resources on our, our website for folks to look at. So if, if you have the ability to go to a private uh, uh, tester, please do so. If you can't, then, then use Austin Public Health or Community Care. But we really wanna make sure that those that have no other access other than the public testing uh, can access that. Uh, you know, it's, it's really the most important for people who are symptomatic. Uh, it's important for folks who have known close exposure to uh, a COVID-19 individual. Uh, and it's less important at this stage for those who are asymptomatic. Uh, so please continue to go to the website. We'll have additional resources up there uh, where we can point folks to other, other locations for testing uh, that may suit them. If I can add to that, to Dr. Escott's point, you know, Penn Central Health has many clinics open. I'm gonna speak in Spanish now to my Spanish patients. Las personas que necesitan usar community care, hay, tenemos muchas clínicas de community care para usar. Aquí en la clínica Zamora también estamos haciendo los exámenes. ARC, Austin Regional Clinic, también está haciendo los exámenes. Si uno cree que tiene COVID, hace la prueba. Se pueden hacer aquí, o en community care, o Austin Regional. Pero como dice el doctor Escott, hay muchas, hay muchas oportunidades para hacerlo. Gracias.
All right, the next question is from KVU. Uh, Austin Public Health is keeping us updated on a good running tally for hospital admissions, current hospitalizations, ICU patients, and ventilator patients, but we don't have a grasp. What we don't have a grasp on is the percentage of total capacity those tallies represent. What is the total capacity for each of those categories, and is that data that can be made public for our tracking purposes? Uh, so we are working on uh, a gauge style um, display for our, our dashboard that will have each of those capacities as well as where we are. Uh, again, it's, you know, sometimes the, the hospital capacity is per portrayed as, well, it's a number, you, you must know it. And the answer is it depends. I mean, there's the physical space, but there is the equipment and there's the people that have to be factored in. So there has to be predictions on, okay, well, we have a bed. Are we going to have a nurse, a tech, a, a physician to staff that bed? And those all are considerations that our hospitals are working hard to, to provide us a, a reasonable number for. Uh, we think we're there, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that by the end of this week, we'll have the ability to display that and share that publicly. Uh, when it comes to the estimated surge capacity for hospital beds, that number is, is 1,500. Uh, so there's been some changes in that. It was 1,100 for a while, and then we went to 1,400. The best estimate right now is 1,500 beds, uh, which we can reasonably expect to be able to utilize for, uh, for COVID-19 patients. There are obviously many more beds than that in our community. Some are pediatric beds, some are rehab beds, some are psychiatric beds. Uh, there are some beds which are easily converted to COVID-19 beds and there are others which are not. Uh, and I'd be happy to, to pass it to, um, to one of my colleagues if they wanna provide a little bit more detail about the differences in, in the kind of beds. Well, hey, this is uh, Ross Holman. I just wanted to add to that is that right now, as an emergency physician and all the emergency departments around, we have the capacity to treat anybody that walks in through the door. Um, and we are at that, we are able to provide that because of the training that we have and because of the, the preparations that we've made up into now and because of the fact that we're able to flatten the curve so well. And I'm not sure that capacity right now is as important as what our capacity is gonna look like in the future. And to make sure that we continue to have capacity to take care of patients. That's why it's so important now to make sure that we continue to practice our social distancing, to make sure that we practice, you know, wearing our masks, washing our hands, all of the things that led us to this point to be able to get to where we are, that we continue to do those measures to make sure that we continue to have that capacity. Thank you. Next question is from Co-op Radio. How is Austin Public Health working with the Department of uh, state health services and other statewide local public health authorities to support medical professionals, maintain strategies for preventing community spread and share resources. So we, we talk to our colleagues from around the state on a weekly basis. Uh, I've had several conversations with, with Commissioner Hellerstedt and his staff this week on a number of issues. Uh, we've had you know a, a meeting with Metropolitan uh, uh, public health departments over the weekend to talk about strategy. So this is this is happening regularly. And as I said earlier this week, um, you know, it, it's a process of constant reevaluation of strategy. Uh, there's some strategies that will work during some phases of this outbreak and others that won't. And so we ha constantly have to look at what, what's happening, look at the strategies that we have in place for addressing the outbreak and have the ability to pivot if it's needed. And, uh, and those are the kind of discussions that, that we're having statewide right now. Uh, I, I've been very pleased with our partnership with the Texas Division of Emergency Management and uh, DSHS in, in those conversations. Uh, they've been very engaged and, and very open and, in offering uh, supplies and support. And uh, we will continue to count on those partnerships as we, as we continue to surge. Next question is from Austonia. Dr. Escott told county commissioners yesterday that contact tracing is not as effective here as it has been in other, in other countries. Will Austin Public Health continue its contact tracing efforts? So we are continuing contact tracing. The discussion yesterday was about some of the challenges to contact tracing. 
Uh, right now, there's a, a backlog of, of testing results. Uh, so a lab may be collected, uh, you know, I, I did some this weekend, collected on the 15th or 17th of June, being processed you know, after being received on the 21st of June. But the person developed symptoms the week before that. So if it's two weeks, 10 days even, after the person began getting ill before we had start the contact tracing, the, the exposure time is over. The people who they exposed are probably already sick. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's challenging. It's not, a, it's not gonna catch everybody. And my concern is that, that the public may be relying on contact tracing to, to, to contain this. We have uncontrolled, uncontained, widespread transmission of disease across the state of Texas and across the United States. The message that people need to get is when they leave their home, there's a risk of exposure. It doesn't matter how many cases have been identified in their zip code. It doesn't matter if people look sick or not. The risk is there. It's as simple as that. People have to understand that. That's why we are making uniform recommendations that people social distance. If they have to go out of their house, that they wear a mask and they have uh, discipline in regards to their hands, right? Washing their hands frequently, avoiding touching their face. Um, you know, contact tracing has a place, but where we've seen it work in other countries is ex exhaustive contact tracing generally while those jurisdictions are closed. Right now, what happens when you call somebody who's a positive and you ask them where they've been over the past week, they've been everywhere. They've been at grocery stores and restaurants and bars and friends' houses. They've had contact with hundreds of people. Contact tracing in that circumstance is not gonna be as effective. So that's why we're asking people not to depend on contact tracing at this stage of, of the outbreak. We need their support, we need their engagement. Uh, we need them to join in on this mission. Um, I just wanna reinforce that contact tracing does have an important uh, role going forward. In this period of epidemic spread, it's not as important as the message that Dr. Escott just gave that we need to reduce total contacts and risk of any transmission, but we need to be building that contact tracing infrastructure and we're working every day to get better at it so that when we get past this peak, when people do make the changes to slow spread, that contact tracing will help speed the decrease in the rate of infections so that we get closer to being safe and able to do the things we wanna do every day. Uh, so absolutely contact tracing is important going forward. We've had success here in Austin doing it when we were in a period of lockdown and we can continue to do that going forward. This is from KXLU Austin. What is the capacity of Austin hospitals to take on COVID-19 patients? Over several months, why have the hospitals not been able to come to agreement on a single number so they can help local government prepare for a surge? The emphasis here is getting a single number. Uh, let me take that. Uh, I've just talked about that. Uh, the number we've arrived at is 1,500. Uh, and I'll ask, you know, we've got some, some colleagues on the line here. Uh, you know, if we have some questions, we can direct at them. Uh, I know their time is valuable. They're going to have to leave very soon. Should I go ahead to the next question or does someone else? Yes, please. Okay. Um, this is from CBS Austin. How are area hospitals preparing for a surge in hospitalizations? Is there enough beds and what are the protocols in place for if, when slash if they reach capacity? This is Dr. Nieto from Del Seton Medical Center and Bell Children's Hospital. Um, I've been uh, the lead in our group, our hospitalist group at Del Seton Medical Center since March in developing our surge planning. Um, I can assure everyone that we do have the ability to provide um, med appropriate medical care, protocolized medical care with the best evidence possible in the current state um, in the beds that Dr. Escott just uh, mentioned. Um, I can also attest to the incredible collaboration among our hospital systems, unlike 
uh, that, that quite frankly surprised me with Baylor Scott and White, um, St. David's and um, the Seton leadership really joining together um, to um, ensure that we are able as a community to um, accommodate whatever illness we see. Um, and also with the Austin Public Health infrastructure and um, the development of alternative care sites that do exist. And um, the, the planning that we've done is extensive. It mirrors that of other large cities in pandemics. But as everyone on this call has mentioned, we don't want to get there. We do not want to provide care for you in Austin Convention Center. We want you to stay home, play in your beautiful outdoor weather, um, be with your family, and not spend a month in our hospital. Thank you. The next question is from Univision, um, and they ask that for someone to respond in Spanish, if possible. There is information that funding for testing sites might be ending soon, and one of the most impacted states will be Texas. How will this impact our area? Why is it so important to wear face masks? When is it important to report businesses that are not requiring the use of face masks? Well, I'm gonna, I will respond if Dr. Escott can answer for you because I have not heard that. Dr. Escott? Yeah, I'm not aware of the, the discussion regarding ending funding on, on testing. Uh, we are, we are gonna to continue to test. Uh, we will sort out where the where the funding comes from. Um, it's it's absolutely essential, and and uh, it is uh, it is going to be something that that Austin Public Health and Community Care and others will will continue to provide. Um, what was the, you had a, a second part of that question other than testing? Why is it so important to wear face masks? When is it important to report businesses that are not requiring the use of face masks? Uh, so face masks are important, and, and you know we've suspected that face masks were going to work. But as we've gone through this pandemic, and we talked about this early on, we're going to learn a whole lot very quickly about about some of these public health experiments. And one of the one of the lessons is face masks are even better than we thought in relation to decreasing the transmission of disease. Um, it's it works best when the person who has COVID is wearing it and the person who doesn't have COVID is wearing it. Uh, in that circumstance, it's been very successful. And we've seen some cases like in, uh, in Springfield, Missouri, where we had two hairdressers that both had COVID who interacted with 140 clients over the period of time where they were infectious. But in their, in their facility, they didn't have people in the waiting room. They required masks of the hairdressers and the clients and they had zero transmissions. So, you know, just as a, as a case, case example of how effective it can be. Uh, uh, regarding enforcement of, of facilities that are not uh, requiring masks, uh, those calls should go to 311. I'll tell you that, that you know, I have uh, oversight over food and permitted businesses, restaurants in particular, places that serve food. And if, uh, if, if I learn of a, of a business such as a restaurant who is not requiring masks, then, then I will take action against that restaurant. Uh, we, we simply must move to the stage of enforcement rather than reinforcement. We've got to have the community involved in, in uh, being part of the solution. That includes our, our businesses. Como dice el doctor Esca, ni él ni yo hemos oído que van a haber casos que no van a, no va a haber dinero para pagar los, los exámenes que se necesita para COVID. Sabemos muy bien que yo, como pa, el pasado, pasado presidente de la, de la Central Health, que mire qué va a seguir haciendo las pruebas. Si hay dinero o no hay dinero, como quiera se van a hacer. Uh, de las máscaras, las tapabocas, si uno encuentra un lugar que no está, usando, que no está enforzando que use la tapaboca en su lugar, Nomás de llamar al número, al número 311, el 311, y ellos reportan a eso al, al Departamento de Seguridad aquí en Austin y también al Departamento de, de County, de, del condado. Entonces, so, si uno mira un, un lugar que nomás no lo está importando, llámale a 311. Que yo sepa, ni, ni el doctor Escat, no, no hemos oído ningún caso que no se están pagando los casos para, los, para las pruebas. Siguen viniendo a los, a, los, a los lugares, a Community Care, a Austin Regional Clinic, 
donde sea, pero vayan a hacerse las pruebas. Gracias. Thank you, Dr. Zamora. Uh, we understand at this time that some of you may need to jump off the call. We will continue to answer questions. So at this time, I would like to thank all of our medical professionals uh, for joining us today, and we'll move on with the next question. Next question is from Community Impact. We saw a spike in hospitalizations both locally and across the state following large gatherings over Memorial Day weekend. Are you concerned about a repetition of this trend with the 4th of July approaching? Are there plans for any additional restrictions over the 4th of July weekend to limit restriction to limit risk? Uh, well, I was pleased with the with the governor's uh, action yesterday to uh, to drop the the uh, the recommendation to 100 as far as when local uh, authorities can uh, take action or further restrict uh, large gatherings. Uh, you know, again, I, I think we're at the phase where we shouldn't be gathering in more than 10 people. Uh, for those at high risk, it really should not be anybody outside their household. household. Uh, we have to take those protective actions. I know it's, it's Independence Day. We want to celebrate our country. We want to celebrate with our family. But we are putting people in danger when we do that. And it may not be the young people getting it who, who bear the brunt of it. It may be their parents or their aunts or uncles or friends. Uh, we have to understand that we are responsible for each other. And, and we just can't take the chance at this stage of having substantial increases as a result of Independence Day, the 4th of July celebrations. Uh, we need people to be sensible. We need them to, if they want to watch a fire show, fireworks show, do it from a car with only your family members in it. Watch them on TV. Find other ways to celebrate our history. Um, we, we are at a critical point right now, and, and we simply can't afford to make mistakes. The next question is from Telemundo, and they ask uh, for someone to respond in Spanish, if possible. How successful has the city and health department's efforts been when trying to reach the Hispanic community with information and resources? Has there been a great response from this demographic group when it pertains to more testing? Have there been any improvements when it comes to hospitalization numbers and or recovery rates? Jessica, do you wanna take that and I'll, I'll translate? Yes, uh, you know, I, I had the, the great opportunity to uh, be a part of a, a an event this weekend to test a group of construction workers uh, with some coalition members uh, from the Latino community. I, I thought it was a great display of, of a community come together and, and demonstrating strength in, in the midst of adversity. Uh, I think we're seeing powerful um, and passionate people coming together to, to advocate for their community and to do direct outreach to their community. Uh, you, you know, I, I, we have more work to do. I, I think that's clear. We're still seeing uh, our, our Hispanic community being overrepresented in terms of cases and hospitalizations. Uh, so I think it's up to all of us to, to share the message to ensure that, that our Latino community uh, has the, the ability to wear masks. They understand the importance of, of wearing masks and that, uh, that, that they are practicing the, the important social distancing behaviors. I will say that, that one of the particular concerns regarding our communities of color and our, and our communities uh, of impoverished individuals is that as, as we see those groups, we, when we look at, at, at their households, because, because of multi-generational households, because of that challenge with, with regular finances, we have a larger number of people living in smaller places. And so we are seeing transmission, household transmission more common in those groups. And so we are working hard to try to break that cycle of, of household transmission by reminding folks that we have a hotel, uh, which we call an isolation facility for folks to separate themselves from their family members to decrease that risk of transmission. And this week, we will also be providing uh, some personal protective equipment, particularly masks, uh, to those individuals who are going through and getting tested for COVID-19 uh, so that they can be safer even when they're at home to try to prevent that transmission to other, other family members. 
Pues sabemos muy bien que en, la, en, el, en el grupo de color, los afro, afro latinos, afro, afroamericanos y los latinos, hay más incidencia de, de COVID en esos grupos. En lo que dijo el doctor Escar es que este, este fin de semana tuvieron una conferencia con unos grupos de trabajadores de, de construcción donde se hicieron las pruebas ahí con ellos. Uh, es muy importante lo, lo que hemos dicho todos los, todos los doctores, usar su tapabocas, usar sus guantes, lavarse bien las manos, no tocarse la cara, mantener las reuniones menos de 10. Uh, y si uno está en una casa con bastantes personas y uno está enfermo, tratar de aislar a esa persona para que no se enfermen los demás. Pero seguir haciendo las, las pruebas que uno necesita. Él ya, tu, tuvo la oportunidad de platicar, platicar con, bien con el doctor Jason Tickett, que, es el, el, que está encargado del, del departamento de emergencia. También ellos están yendo a, a las iglesias, pasando uh, papeles diciendo con, dónde se pueden hacer las pruebas. El doctor Tickett, el doctor Esca también está haciendo lo mismo, yendo a las iglesias, pasando información o dónde se pueden hacer las, las pruebas. Gracias. The next question is from the Austin Chronicle. Children were thought to be largely spared from COVID-19 and due to school closures, they have been largely shielded from exposure. And now we are hearing more about a delayed and serious syndrome that occurs in some cases. As summer activities pick up and a new school year looms, what do we know about the risk to children and what should parents be looking for in the way of signs or symptoms? I can comment briefly on that. So we, we are, we have seen cases of what they call MISD, so the multi-system inflammatory syndrome of coronavirus um, at Bell Children's Hospital. Um, interestingly, most of the cases we've seen have been in teenagers. Um, and fortunately, again, um, related to our delay um, in seeing cases due to our community's um, isolation efforts early on, we, um, had the grace of learning from other systems, New York and Seattle, how to manage these diseases that are completely novel, and we've had good outcomes in those patients. But that doesn't take away the, um, the potential for that impacting more children. Thank you. Um, I'm told this will be the last question um, from the Austin Business Journal. To medical professionals, how is morale among your colleagues and industry right now with the COVID-19 trends over the last few weeks? At this time, how are you all coping with the stress, approaching self-care, et cetera? I'll start off with that one. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I'm in touch with a lot of physicians in the community. Um, and I will say that uh, right now the, the morale is high. Um, everybody is uh, wanting to care for patients and help people get better um, and is very confident in, in doing so. Uh, we feel safe, uh, we have protective equipment and we uh, are not hesitant to care for patients with COVID and all of our other patients. Um, I've cared for patients with COVID myself. Many of my colleagues have. Um, we, uh, in surgery, we have uh, all the appropriate equipment. We have protocols to follow. Um, and, uh, and we just carry on providing the best care possible. Um, I will say there's anxiety, there's concern um, in our offices. Uh, we are seeing staff um, becoming ill, having to stay home for a while. So it puts, a, it puts stress on the rest of the staff because for a while the office can be shorthanded until people are recovered and can come back to work. Um, so, so there is some anxiety, but, uh, but that's not uh, overwhelming and is not preventing us from doing what we need to do. I'd just like to add that I, I think the fact that that question got asked in this forum is, uh, is, is very heartwarming. And, um, and I think it's one of the reasons why the morale is staying good among healthcare professionals. Uh, speaking for myself, uh, I've had friends from people that I knew in high school and college that I hadn't heard from in 20 or 30 years who reached out to me just to make sure I was okay knowing what I do for a living. Uh, and so those are people that have been close to me in my life, but also in this community uh, and even watching the comments under the live stream here today of, of people who are just going out of their way to uh, 
to acknowledge the position that healthcare workers are in and uh, and to thank us for our service, um, I think is is helping to keep us all energized. And um, and it is true that there is anxiety in the ranks. Uh, most of my anxiety that I feel is for everybody who's out there because uh, uh, I'm educated enough to know just how bad this thing can get and what an impact that will have. I've, I've seen this disease and how devastating it can be for certain individuals and, um, and not just people who you would traditionally think are at risk, but ye yesterday uh, we admitted a couple of people in their 20s and 30s who are struggling to breathe. Um, that's, that's very real and it's very heartbreaking to watch that. And, and so I, I worry about myself and my staff, but I know how to keep us safe. I worry more about the people of this community and uh, the reluctance that we've seen among some subset of the population to really do what they need to do to keep everybody safe. And I just want to add on to that as, you know, as emergency physicians and emergency professionals and hospital professionals, we train for this. I mean, we prepare for this for a lot of times, you know, our entire career. So we kind of know what we're getting into. Um, and people ask me all the time, how am I doing or how are you doing? And, and my answer is, is that, you know, I'm doing fine, but I worry about, like Dr. Sabell said, you know, the people of the community, the frontline workers at the grocery store, the auto repair people, we are all on the same planet during this, you know, this crisis. And it's times like this where humanity really needs to go out and reach out and, and, and check on your neighbor, check on your friend, like Dr. Sabell said, I mean, he, he was heartwarmed when somebody checked on him. So reach out to a loved one and, and just check and see how they're doing because this is a challenging time for us all and it's really important to reach out and, and um, feel that humanity that we're all on the same planet and care for one another. And Francis, I wonder if you would care to comment. So as a physician, when I'm making rounds, I come in, I put on my mat, my N95 mask, my hat, my uh, gown. I'm in there for a few minutes with the patient and then I get to take it off and leave. The nurses are there all day, all shift with that, with those garments and protective equipment on all day long. It's really hot, it's really confining and it's tough. And I'd like, I wonder if Francis would like to comment. I think the team has done a tremendous job of, of pulling together and caring for these patients. The, the personal protective equipment can get hot and uh, the uh, negative airflow rooms sometimes um, are, um, are hot in relation to uh, the impact it has on, on the air conditioning. Um, so uh, that, that does impact. I think there's um, a tremendous emotional part to it as well for the staff because the families can't be present in the COVID rooms. Oftentimes they're sick themselves. And so um, they are an extension of the patient's personal connection and family. And so it, it emotionally impacts them, and uh, so it can be very hard. Um, we also have had an opportunity after uh, several uh, months of uh, care to celebrate with families too, um, uh, to see people recover from the virus. But it, it is uh, a long uh, and hard road for those folks who have been ventilated uh, to get back to um, their their state of health, and some folks have been in their 20s and 30s, and so I don't want there to be a misconception that it only impacts um, people in nursing homes. Uh, it, it has the potential to impact all of us, and so the best we can do to minimize our risk of trying not to touch our eyes, our nose, our mouth, um, wash our hands, wear our masks, um, to minimize the risk is always good. I think we also find a lot of comfort in each other um, and just um, debriefing with each other about the emotional uh, impact of that. So um, there's been a lot of wonderful support and an outpouring from the community um, through lots of different mechanisms and that has sustained us as well. So, um, so we, we feel uh, the love and the support of one another and uh, and I think that has given us a lot of strength. Well, on behalf of uh, all Austinites, we appreciate your hard work and for joining us today. 
Um, I'll now pass it off to Dr. Escott for any final thoughts. Thank you. I just want to thank my colleagues for, for taking this opportunity to, to share their perspective. Uh, you know, the public's heard from me for for too many weeks, and uh, and these are the folks who are on the front lines. So I have the luxury of most of the time being in an office and and looking at spreadsheets and, and, and talking to you all. Uh, but they're doing the hard work. Uh, they're put, putting themselves at risk, and uh, and, and they're seeing the the faces of of COVID nineteen. Uh, so I just want to thank them for 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 being here today. And, uh, and on behalf of the city and county, uh, thank you for your service in, in, uh, in this community. Thank you, Dr. Escott. That thank concludes you. today's press conference. Will Dupree here in the KXAN live studio. You've been listening to that press conference involving 10 medical professionals, including the interim health authority for Austin, Travis County. I don't know about you all, but to hear from all of them all at once, sharing one clear message to everyone out here and kind of warning people, it was very effective and very moving. And I see a lot of you all uh, commenting in the uh, comment section on Facebook if you're watching us there thanking them for the job that they've done and I think that's a pretty heartening thing what I hope though is that they will be listened to and heard about what warnings are offering about the situation that we now find ourselves in in the community once again that live signal has been pulled down so we'll pull that away what I want to talk about though is a little bit and recap what they said during that uh, more than hour-long news conference virtually Again, what Dr. Mark Escott, the Interim Health Authority for Austin Travis County said there was that we are in not a great shape here in Austin and Travis County. He did say there was a substantial increase in cases. The moving average at this point of new cases is about 276 per day. That is serious warning for everybody too. And I wanna show those numbers at this point. Uh, so take a look here. These are where the COVID-19 outbreak numbers stand in Travis County. At this time, there are more than 6,000 confirmed cases up till now. And we should say that that's been over the whole period of this uh, pandemic and outbreak. But what we can say is that on Tuesday alone, there were 257 new cases, which is a record. And again, that brings that total up to 6,596. Of those, there are about 1,900 considered active. So, you know, we have to subtract that from there. But 114 people have now died from COVID-19 in Travis County. And finally, there are those numbers for the hospitalizations are just going up at a scary rate, just to be honest. 236 people in the hospital, almost 100 now in intensive care, and 34 are on breathing machines so that they can still survive while fighting COVID-19. Take a look at that. I'm going to leave those up there so you can look and see where this situation stands for Travis County because this is a big deal and we cannot stress that enough. You heard from nine other doctors that work at various healthcare outlets here in our community reiterate the same message and that is that people need to behave like they were back in April. So that means staying at home as much as possible. Yes, the economy is back open and that may be a contradictory thing to say because so much of our life is back to where it was before the COVID-19 pandemic began. However, the warning is out there now from these medical officials and medical experts that we need to go back to doing some of those things. So we need to put on our mask. I've got mine with this fun pattern on it that I put on as soon as I leave this room and wear wherever I go. You need to put the mask on. You need to wash your hands. You need to socially distance yourselves from people that are not in your household. So if you are going to take a walk with a friend that you're not around all the time, try to maintain that distance or keep a mask on. It's not only to protect you, but it's to protect your friend and everyone that you might come into contact with and vice versa. So. Again, nine health professionals, nine doctors, um, including a registered nurse as well, 
spoke up and talked about those things. Dr. Mark Escott also warned that if changes are not made in behavior and the rate of increase in hospitalizations and new cases keeps rising, that we could reach hospital capacity in Austin Travis County by mid-July. We are past the midpoint now in June. That is only a couple of weeks away at this point. So it is in our power to be able to change that and force the direction of this to be different. It's on us. And I think that message was made very, very clear with all those medical experts there. I'm going back through our numbers now, I mean my notes rather, to see if I should hit on anything else before we wrap up our stream. I do want to hear from all of you too. If you're watching on Facebook right now, tell me about what safe practices you're doing. Are you wearing your mask as much as you would like to? What instances are you not wearing it? I'd like to hear about that just to kind of get a feel for where everybody stands about these safety guidelines at this point. And I do want to highlight again some of the numbers. So we shared what was happening in Travis County, but all across the state we're seeing a pretty alarming situation. Just yesterday we reported a new record in, ho in new hospitalizations in Texas. There's been a new record set for the past 12 consecutive days. There were 381 new hospitalizations in Texas alone. You can see that in the very far uh, bar right there under June 23rd, above June 23rd on this particular graph that our newsroom has put together. Additionally, we hit new records in new cases. So just yesterday alone, 5,489 new COVID-19 cases in our state. That jump is only going up every single day. The, mess the message from those medical experts is clear. We can change the direction of this by practicing those social distances. And Dr. Mark Escott, the Interim Health Authority for Austin Travis County, said that he may move to take some more enforcement and encourage the mayor and city manager to do so as well. He said that he is not afraid of making, taking actions against businesses that are not enforcing that mask rule now. So businesses here in Austin and Travis County are required to make customers and employees wear a mask whenever they come inside or they're at work. So we'll have to see and follow up on what happens from there. We want to thank you again for watching, and I'm going to go back through the comments um, under this Facebook feed and watch some of it and maybe respond to some of you guys as well because I see some comments coming in from there. We do appreciate you all watching. Our reporting continues on KXAN.com and the KXAN News app. We will have more wrap-ups on this at 435 and 6 over on KXAN News, so please tune in then. We do appreciate you once again watching. I'm Will Dupree here in the KXAN Live studio. Please, everyone, stay safe and healthy and, according to these me medical experts, at home. Thanks again.